I am just waiting for Athena. She's just dropped off. So if we just give her one minute, um, she will be back into the environment and then we will make a quick start. So if you just bear with us for one minute, we will, we will make the start. Thank you. Hey, Athena. Can you hear me? I can. We're in the session. Thank you for joining. Oh, gosh. Sorry. That's OK. <laughs> the screen, screen keeps freezing. So. Not a problem. Um, so we'll make a we'll make a, a, a quick start um, so that we can get yep. through what is no doubt a lot of a lot of information in a reasonably short period of time. Um, Yep. Our topic today is, is obviously um, accessible liability, which is without doubt a hot topic here in Australia. It's well known and reported that the Fair Work Ombudsman are keenly pursuing businesses and, and also their employees, so individuals, for their uh, involvements in, in contraventions. So, you know, the question and I guess um, some of the answers that, we, that, that we'll get from you today is, you know, what else do we need to know? You know how can how can we support our employer um, from from getting exposed? Um, how can we stop exposure to ourselves as individuals? Um, and um, you know, as we work through this presentation, I've had a quick look at it. I know it will um, give us a, an insight into the standard and the impact for individuals, and also some recent developments that we all need to be aware of. So, again, thank you for joining us, Athena, and I will pass across to you. Thanks very much, Ross. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, this is an interesting topic. And of course, we're doing a bite-sized session today. Um, so I'm going to skim through some of the recent case law. But um, obviously, as you would have read in the invitation to this session, um, one of the recent cases that I want to spend a little bit more time on is the case of MTCT services and the Australian Workers Union that we'll get to at the uh, end of the slide session. Um, however, the First thing that I wanted to just make sure that everybody is familiar with, of course, um, is that I'm sure you are because Tracy and her um, and uh, the Australian Payroll Association talk regularly about um, prosecutions by the Fair Work Ombudsman in relation to underpayments of wages or non-payments of wages or um, other errors that occur in relation to the remuneration of employees. Um, this is a very clever slide that somebody more clever than me put together just with a little selection of some of the headlines from the Fair Work Ombudsman's website um, of recent, uh, in the recent past. Um, and you can uh, certainly note that only in the last week or so, um, big organisations like Rebel um, have come out and said, oh, look, unfortunately, we've made some mistakes too and there's been underpayment of wages occurring on our watch. So it is something that is no longer, um, uh, I, I might be caught. It is a question of when you will be caught um, and then what the consequences for your organisation might be. Um, obviously, I know I'm talking to a group of um, payroll professionals largely and other people who are engaged in running their businesses. And of course, you're here because we want to make sure that we're doing everything right. Um, and that hope, hopefully this session will be helpful to you in that regard, um, making sure that you know we know what we're doing um, with the support of the Australian Payroll Association, of course, um, and other advice if you need it. But you know this is really a, a very serious topical issue at the moment, and it's not going away. So, what is Section 550 of the Act? This is the meat um, of on the bone of personal liability in relation to breaches of the obligations under the Fair Work Act. So as you can see here from the section, and I promise this will be the only section that I actually quote, um, we're talking about involvement in a contravention. 
And as you can see, the involvement in a contravention is treated exactly the same way as an actual contravention. So you are um, under this section involved in a contravention um, if you have aided or abetted or counselled or procured the contravention. What does that mean in English? Um, you facilitated it. So hypothetically, you are a payroll manager who knows that your organisation is not paying overtime correctly. Um, you have aided and abetted that ongoing breach by processing the payroll where you know that um, entitlements are not being paid correctly. Um, you have induced the contravention. So you might be the boss of an organisation who doesn't believe in paying overtime at penalty rates. You might simply believe in paying overtime only at standard rates. Um, and so you direct everybody within your organisation to only pay ordinary hours for every hour that is worked. You're inducing the contravention, whether by threats or promises or otherwise. Um, you may have been directly or indirectly knowingly concerned in or party to the contravention, um, which is an interesting one we'll talk about a bit later, um, or you've conspired with others to affect the contravention. So you're, um, accountant and the business owner and the payroll person and the HR manager all get together and go, we're going to contravene the act by not paying people correctly. We just don't believe in paying um, overtime or um, meal allowances or any of those other sort of things that so we're just not going to do it. Um, and that's a conspiracy, obviously, to commit a contravention under the act. Um, if there was any doubt about what all of that means, um, the standard we would suggest is now very clear. So Judge Burkhart in FWO and Ausstaff in 2016 said that a person who knows of the contravention and takes no steps to correct it is clearly in some way, at least indirectly, a person who has in any way by act or omission, directly or indirectly, knowingly, it is by in any way by act or omission, directly or indirectly, knowingly concerned in or party to the contravention. And this, when we started talking about this in this conversation with certainly the payroll community, did cause a significant degree of concern because um, the question that was often posed to me was, Athena, are you saying that I should quit my job if I know that payroll is not being processed correctly? Um, and I would say, uh, yes, you probably should, which seems very harsh and unreasonable. But if there was any doubt as to whether or not that was good advice, if not practical advice, uh, Judge Burkhart certainly puts that to bed. And this is the standard that um, we suggest that everybody should adopt. If you know of a contravention, you are obligated to take some steps to try and correct it. Um, and if it looks like your organisation is not going to correct it, then you're probably better off not being there, um, at least from a self-preservation point of view. There are obviously, and we'll just, I'm going to um, skim very quickly through uh, some of the cases which point out co consequences for persons who have been found to be involved in contraventions. So um, the case of WY Proprietary Limited uh, is um, a case involving two employees who worked on holiday visas for a Japanese fine food outlet in Brisbane. Um, and they were paid a flat rate of $15.60 per hour and lodged requests for, for assistance with the FWO. So the FWO investigated and in 2012 provided warnings to the employer, but despite that warning, the employer continued to recruit and underpay vulnerable overseas workers, and they didn't change that initial flat hourly rate for almost four years. Um, so once the FWO worked out that despite the warnings, this employer continued to do the wrong thing, it commenced proceedings um, and, try and wanted to secure penalties and orders against the company, its director and the payroll and accounts manager. So ultimately the court found that the director and payroll account manager were involved in the contraventions committed by, by the company, consistent with section 550 of the Act. Um, and in addition to having to pay the employees the amount that was owed by way of back pay, the company was penalised a total sum of $116,250 and the director was personally penalised the sum of $20,000. The payroll and account manager was personally penalised the sum of $7,000. So you can see there, there's some real world contraventions for failing to pay people correctly. Um, and those consequences obviously continue on. Um, I'm sure anybody who wants to Google that case of WY would be able to find out the name of the unfortunate payroll and account manager, which is not necessarily something that you want to find when people Google you. Um, 
In the Fair Work Ombudsman and New Shanghai Charleston, um, the company operated a Chinese restaurant in Charleston um, and proceedings were commenced against the company as well, well as its sole director, its human resources manager and the store manager for breaches of the act relating to underpayment of minimum wages. Um, the court found that the director, human resources manager and the store manager were accessorily liable for breaches of the act concerning underpayments and were also involved in creating and producing false time and wage records and pay slips in response to a notice to produce from the FWO. Uh, never a good idea. The FWO pretty much already knows what it's looking for when it asks you to produce records and if you produce false ones, um, that's not going to get you very far. Um, but Human Resources denied that she had a role in any of it um, and claimed that she was uh, dependent on the employment and that she was required to be obedient to the restaurant director. So that was sort of her attempt at a defence. Um, but the court did not accept that the HR manager had limited culpability. Um, and there was evidence that she provided advice to the restaurant in about 2013 about correct award entitlements, but knowingly continued to participate in the contraventions. So, so she's made some effort. She's taken steps to alert the employer to the fact that they're paying incorrectly. Uh, but then when the employer decided to do nothing, um, she backed off and stopped pursuing the matter. So uh, the court also was very unimpressed that the manager had an active role to play in the creation of false documents um, and was aware that those false documents would be provided to the FWO. Um, the court commented that, e that the human had, quote, the moral choice to walk away rather than to continue in to participate in the offending. Um, and also that there was nothing wrong with sending a message that an employee should indeed resign if that is the only alternative to continuing to participate knowingly in illegal activity, ideally coupled with reporting the conduct, as in this case, to the FWO. So the HR manager in that instance um, was penalised $21,760 uh, for the role that she played in that particular series of offences. Talking um, just quickly about the case of um, Sona Peaks, and I'm very sorry, but I'm having a little bit of difficulty switching slides, so bear with me, but I'm just going to run through um, the Fair Work Ombudsman and, and Sona Peaks, uh, which was um, an Indian restaurant operated in Bendigo, that operated in Bendigo and uh, the company was run by a sole director, uh, Mr. Anderson. So Mr. Anderson was responsible for engaging employees to work in the restaurant. Um, and in 2015, the Fair Work Ombudsman commenced proceedings against the company and Mr. Anderson for contraventions, surprisingly, in relation to the underpayment of employees. As a result of those proceedings, Mr. Anderson was ordered to pay a penalty of $23,715 for his involvement in the contraventions, but he persistently failed to comply with the court's orders um, about payment of that amount. So he basically said, yep, you can penalise me, but I'm not paying anything and uh, bad luck there. So uh, because he cons consistently failed to comply with an order of the court to pay a penalty, the court, uh, the FWO applied to the court for an attachment of earnings order, which in the old language is a garnishee order. Um, so Mr. Anderson's new employer, Metro Trains in Melbourne, um, had to make payments from Mr. Anderson's earnings at a specified rate each payday until the balance of the penalty plus costs was satisfied. So uh, the pay, each um, pay day was about two and a half thousand dollars um, and of that the consolidated revenue fund took about four hundred and fifty dollars each pay day. Um, so costs were ordered he was not represented and didn't appear at the hearing and I guess the message out of that particular case involving Sona Peaks is uh, you can ignore the fact that you have been prosecuted and penalised, but that's not necessarily going to stop the FWO from following you um, and trying to secure um, reimbursement of that penalty by whichever means it considers necessary. So um, uh, just also quickly in the matter of um, Fair Work Ombudsman and Greenan, um, Mr Green, this was a very interesting one, uh, which involves some very dodgy goings on um, about not paying uh, an employee correctly. So um, Mr Greenan provided labour hire 
uh, to an organisation, um, Melbourne City Reno, um, but <laughs> the agreement was not necessarily about paying the employee, um, um, but it was about obtaining a vehicle. So the matter we raised simply because um, there was clearly obligations to fail with record keeping, failing to comply with notices that were issued um, by the FWO, um, and that uh, there was um, a power to um, um, issue audit, commence court proceedings against him personally, even though he um, refused to participate in that particular series of litigation. Um, he found the judge in this instance took the most unusual step of finding that the conduct was so nefarious that an order be made that the matter be referred to the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution. This, this was the investigation for. Mr Greenan um, as a result of the very dodgy dealings that he made in relation to providing this particular labour hire worker to an organisation and then not paying them correctly. Um, and then the last matter that I'd just like to mention before we talk about uh, the principal case that we um, wanted to talk about today is the Fair Work Ombudsman and Lee Allen Jorgensen. Um, some of these cases are very interesting if you ever have time to have a look at them. Um, the details of them and how people manage to get themselves into such difficulty um, is always, I guess, engenders some sympathy because you can see that people just sometimes try and sometimes wind up in difficulty and sometimes just are blatantly doing the wrong thing, which is most um, disappointing. But in, in this instance, uh, Judge Vasta of the Federal Court sentenced the owner of the business to 12 months imprisonment for contempt of court for his failure to follow the Federal Circuit Court's orders about paying the penalty. That was um, the ultimate result of being prosecuted for um, underpayment of wages issues. So the owner appealed the outcome and a stay order was issued. I mean, uh, this was the first matter that we had come across where somebody had been um, ordered to go to jail as a result of not paying a penalty arising out of these sort of matters. Um, but the terms of the stay order that are in place include that um, the gentleman has to surrender his passport, not leave Queensland without permission, um, report to a police station twice a week and reside at a known address. So that's pretty much a criminal set of bail laws that we're seeing that right there. Um, and that is a difficulty indeed uh, in, for Mr Jorgensen in relation to conducting his life in general moving forward. So, um, I apologise that I can't uh, change the slides here for you, but um, the last matter that I wanted to talk about quickly is the matter of MTCC services and not for a change, the FWO, but the Australian Workers' Union. So in this matter, um, the point of it is that it's not just the Fair Work Ombudsman that can bring claims alleging accessorial liability for a Fair Work Act breach under Section 550. So in this particular matter, the Federal Court granted the AWU, the AMWU and the CEPU permission to amend a cross-claim to allege that the company's industrial relations manager was involved in contraventions of the Act. So it was alleged that these contraventions resulted from NTCC failing to properly apply the transfer of business provisions in the Act to its employees and the industrial instruments that applied to their employment. So the unions claim that they are involved in those contraventions of the Act. Um, and while I guess this has to be considered in light of the backdrop, which is that there are a series of long running disputes with um, MTCT and its parent company UGL, uh, concerning paying conditions for contract maintenance workers in uh, Bass Strait. Um, nevertheless, it demonstrates that the accessorial liability provisions of the Act are not only to be utilised as enforcement methods by the FWO, but can be also utilised by other parties who are pursuing claims under the F Fair Work Act. Um, we already know that in adverse action and in other types of proceedings under the Fair, Fair Work Act, it is not unusual for an individual to be named who is ostensibly the one who is supposed to be the heart and mind of the organisation making the decision that is indeed adverse or alleged to be unlawful. Um, and this, I think, is the way of the future moving forward, um, where there is a claim brought by an individual or a union in relation to a breach of the Fair Work Act, whether that be 
non-compliance with an award or enterprise agreement term um, or an underpayment of wages, then these are the sort of things where you can expect that individuals will be named and accused of um, accessorial liability. Um, so those are really the only things that I wanted to talk about today, Ross. I'm happy to take questions or to um, take whatever next steps are appropriate to facilitate the discussion here, if you like. Thank you, Athena. Um, if it's OK, I, I might ask a question to begin with. And if anybody um, around the country um, has a question, please feel free to type it into the chat function and um, we will do our best to answer um, as many questions as we possibly can in the remaining uh, nine minutes. Receive a copy of the recording. Now, my question, Athena, is, um, you know, what, as an individual um, on this call who may have some concerns, what would be a good next step for them? Um, one from a business perspective and the employer, but also from an individual perspective. Hey, Athena. Did you get catch that? Where? Are you still there? Athena, have I Athena, are you there? no longer in the session. However, um, we do have the, um, the questions from each individual and um, I will take note of your name. We do have your email, um, so I'll make sure that each of those are responded to um, individually. Um, I apologize for um, the loss of Athena from the call. Um, something's obviously happened at her end, um, unless she appears back. Uh, I'm, I'm back. I'm back. back. Sorry you, about that. Did you get my question? No, I didn't, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so my question was, you know, what would be a good next step for individuals who are on this call when you look at it from a, you know, from an employer perspective, but also from an individual perspective? Thanks, Ross. Um, look, I, I think the critical thing is, and you can see, I guess, through companies that are coming out and self-declaring, I know there was certainly one of Tracy's emails about Lush um, coming out and declaring that they had uh, identified themselves that there was an issue and were rectifying it. Um, that is the best possible outcome for you. If you think that there's something wrong or if you're not entirely sure, um, do your own audit um, or arrange for somebody um, to come in and um, to conduct a really mean audit just to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Um, it is better off finding out yourself that there is a problem and allowing you to fix it rather than having the FWO or the union or somebody else knocking down the door and giving you very limited time to get yourself into a compliant state or declare what the problems are. So that would be my strong recommendation. If you think that you sniff a bit of smoke, let's get in there and sort out what the issues are before somebody else does. Okay. Um, and I'm just now going to...
respond to some of the questions that we've received through the chat. One of them was in relation to payroll software providers, um, so providers who obviously um, sell and service software. Um, what risks um, uh, are, are there today um, in relation to the software providers themselves? Look, I think the um, issues for software providers are that they should be able to satisfy themselves and their customers that they are providing a compliant product. Um, and I know that the position generally is that we'll provide the platform and it's up to you to populate it and you have to make sure that you're um, putting all of the penalties, loadings, allowances, rates of pay, um, superannuation contributions, etc., in there that are correct for you. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to be sufficient moving forward. Um, I think that a bit more guidance and support and assistance in terms of making sure that people who are utilising the product um, are able to actually make it work correctly to create a compliant position for themselves will be the way that software vendors start looking at it in the future. Okay. And then we have an interesting one here from a bookkeeper. Um, and um, he or she is asking, you know, how would I protect myself if I'm only responsible for processing the data stroke information that I am given? Mm. Uh, well, look, it, it's a very difficult situation, but unfortunately you've, you've seen the comments there from the judges now, right? Um, which is that if you are um, only responsible for processing data um, and yet you know, or you should reasonably know that the data you're processing is wrong, um, you are better off walking away, and indeed, as one of the judges said, um, you're better off walking away and reporting the matter to the FWO. That is the best protection that I can um, suggest for somebody in that situation. Um, and if you're um, not able to satisfy yourself that the data that you're being given is correct, then that will probably be a fairly difficult conversation for you to have with your client. And I guess the answer, there's another question here, which I, I believe is in the same vein, which is, you know, how liable as an individual um, or an employee of an accountancy practice or, you know, a, a payroll outsourcing provider, you know, am, am, I, am I exposed? Well, look, um, uh, and I guess that's the point of Section 550, you know, back at the beginning of the slide session, we put the actual section up there um, for everyone to see that it's a very broad set of criteria. So, you know, we're talking about a situation here where the um, Act uh, talks about um, um, aiding, abetting, counselling or procuring. So aiding and abetting can simply be processing the payroll, right? And that's a very difficult situation for people to be in. Um, I don't think anybody well, hopefully not anybody that we're talking to today will be talking about inducing the contravention by threats or promises. Um, but otherwise, you know, directly or indirectly, knowingly concerned in or party to. So all you have to be is knowingly concerned in. That's a very low bar. So pretty much if you are somebody who has your hands on a process or um, 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 any other part of um, advice giving or processing done, whether it be by an accounting practice or an outsourced payroll provider or anybody else, um, and you know that it is wrong, then you're in a difficult position in terms of uh, being involved in the contravention. And as you can see there from the heading of the section, involvement in a contravention is treated the same way as an actual contravention. So if you fit within any of those things, Hopefully you're not conspiring or you're not inducing a contravention, but if you're knowingly concerned in or party to, or you're aiding or abetting by continually um, um, processing or continually maintaining the contravention, like the HR manager at the new Shanghai Charleston who said, hey, you know, I was just doing what I was told and I was here on a visa and I was dependent on this employment and um, the culture was that I had to be obedient to my employer. The judge had no time for that and said, look, you know, you should have walked away rather than continue to participate in the contravention. Thank you. And the final question that I'll take from the board, um, if you terminate a client because of payroll issues, can you be held liable in subsequent years down the track? 
Uh, if you're talking being held liable from um, the FWO or somebody else's perspective, I would suggest that's very unlikely. Like if, if you've been um, um, put in a position where the wrong thing is being done and you're going to walk away, well, that's the court's advice to you. And they've, the courts have said it on a number of occasions now, uh, walk away um, and preferably walk away and dob them in to the FWO too. I'm not suggesting that you need to do that, but um, walk away. So if you have walked away on the basis that you refuse to participate in a contravention, I would suggest that it's very unlikely that um, the Fair Work Ombudsman would be looking at you as the sort of target market there to make an example of. Um, uh, that's not a guarantee that you would not be um, prosecuted by the FWO, but I think if you've done what they um, ask you to do, which is to not participate in the contravention once it comes to your attention, then I'm not sure that they could, that much more could be asked of you. Okay. Now we are at the top of the hour. There are, um, I do recognise that um, there are a, a, a number of questions that uh, are in the chat function. Um, what I will do for um, everybody who's joined this call is I will um, share those with Athena. We will provide responses to each of each and every one of those questions, and we will provide the answers um, in addition to the recording um, of this session to everybody that's 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 been on this call. So hopefully we're able to um, provide. Um, additional um, information and insight for you on this particular topic. If anybody wants to continue a conversation with Athena um, when you log off from, um, from this particular environment, there will be a, a, a checkbox at the bottom which can take you to the, the Workplace Law website and um, Athena's details are, are available there for you to reach out and to, and to make contact with, with her business. Um, on behalf of Payroll HQ, um, thank you very, very much for um, participating today. Athena, thanks so much um, to you, the audience, for also taking 30 minutes of, of what's always a busy week um, to spend with ourselves and Athena. Um, with that, I bring the call to a close. Thank you all.